We've been doing a series here on Sunday mornings on the subject of Romans, the letter that the Apostle Paul wrote to the Christians in the very first century. It's one of the most powerful letters that we have in the Word of God. It's also one of the most probably impactful pieces of writing in world history outside of Christian faith. The truths and the thoughts and the ideas that Paul expressed have shaped the world uh, as it has gone forth over the last 2,000 years. So we're studying this letter to understand its truths in the light of what was happening in the people and in the church that Paul was writing to. You know, when Paul wrote this letter up to this moment, uh, the church was largely Jewish people who come to Christ, who received Jesus, and they were excited about Jesus, and they understood that Christ was their Messiah. He was the fulfillment of everything that they had celebrated in Judaism. But then the church began to get flooded with Gentiles, and before long, there were more Gentiles or non-Jewish people who come from paganism filling the church than there were Jewish people in the church. And so Paul, in his letter to Romans, is very carefully writing about the answer to everyone challenge, everyone's need, which is Jesus Christ. He is the Messiah of the Jew. He's also the Savior of the Gentile, and he's the Lord of the church. And so Paul is going back and forth. And in Romans 9, the Apostle Paul is going to take three chapters to stop and explain to his largely Gentile audience why they need to respect Israel. He had to write to the Jewish audience and tell them that they're not saved by the observance of the law and their religious history. They're saved by faith in Christ. But now he's got to tell the Gentile folks, the non-Jews, listen, you need to understand Israel because in Israel's history is the foundation and the base of what we believe. Israel was the first church that God had in the Old Covenant, but now we are the second church. But this church, the church of Jesus Christ, comes from and is grounded in the first church, which was Israel. And so Paul is writing this letter. Now, we're studying some things about Israel because it helps us to understand what God has done for us today in Christ. Now, remember, in Romans 15, verse 4, the Apostle Paul said this, He said, whatever things were written before, those would be the things that were written in the Bible that they had at the time. That would be the Old Testament or the First Testament. Uh, It says they were written for our learning that we, through patience and comfort of the Scriptures, might have hope. And the only Bible they had was the Old Testament Scriptures that were written at that time. That was the Bible that Jesus used, and that was the Bible that all of the first century apostles used. And he said, it's written for us. 1 Corinthians 10 and verse 1, the Apostle Paul says this, Moreover, brothers, I don't want you to be unaware. Everybody say, don't be unaware. unaware. Say, it's very easy as a Gentile to get unaware of the history that our faith comes from. He said, I don't want you to be unaware that all our fathers, meaning the Jewish fathers, were under the cloud, all passed through the sea. All were baptized into Moses in the cloud and in the sea. Just like we're baptized in Christ, they, Israel in the Old Testament, when they became a nation, they went through the Red Sea, that was like a baptism for them. And they all ate the same spiritual food. They all drank the same spiritual drink, for they drank of that rock that followed them, and that rock was Christ. In other words, Jesus was there with the first church, Israel, in the Old Testament. Christ is in their story. Now, in verse 11, he says this, Now, all these things, all the things he's been saying, happened to them, Israel, as examples. They were written for our admonition. Everybody say, it was written for me. Upon whom the ends of the ages have come. So this this church, the church of Jesus Christ, we're living out this period of time until the end of the ages, which is when Christ himself will return and get rid of poverty and sickness and lack and disease and war and famine and hate, and he's going to cleanse this world of all that remains that's evil and restore it to the proper place. We're supposed to live until that day, the end of those ages of man. And so since we're living in this period of time leading up to the return of Jesus, and I believe he's coming back. I don't know when. Somebody said when. I said, I don't know. It could be tonight. But I, I know this. He's coming back. And between, between when Christ first left and now when Christ comes again, the church, that's us. We're in this middle period. And we're the ones upon whom the ends of the human ages have come. We need to go back and read what God did in the first church, Israel, because it will instruct us. Everybody say, teach us. 
written for our admonition, our instruction, our learning, and our growth. And so, so often today, Christians do not have a real grasp on how God revealed himself to the first church, Israel. And when we understand that, it brings so much light on what we have today in Jesus Christ. So learning it is important. In fact, it's very, very important. Now, the first duty that God gave to his church in the Old Testament, Israel, was that they were to live in his presence and follow his voice. They were to, again, live in his presence and follow his voice. Just say that with me, to live in his presence and to follow his voice. And they were a nation of, uh, of people that were disjointed. They were slaves, uh, well over a million of them living in Egypt. And Moses, the uniter, after hearing God's voice and being in God's presence, went, took Israel, brought them out of Egypt, and now they had to become a nation. They had to be formed, and that was a process. So God took them on a journey, and last week we studied their journey from the Red Sea to the mountain of God, which was about a 40, 40 to 49-day journey. We know it was the 49th day after the Passover that they arrived at the mountain of God. And as they were going on that journey, many things happened to them to get them ready to meet the presence of God. Now, they'd seen God's hand work in his judgment of uh, the Egyptian oppressors. He'd seen God split the Red Sea. They had experienced God providing manna, but they hadn't yet been introduced to God personally. All they knew was that this God spoke to Moses, and then they could see what, that God would do things for them, but they had never yet heard God for themselves. And so Moses takes them to the place where he first heard God. Now, a year prior, Moses was an 80-year-old sheep herder. He was taking care of his father-in-law's flocks, Jethro, and he was just kind of living out his retirement years taking care of sheep. And all of a sudden, on this mountain, this mountain called Horeb or Sinai, uh, Moses saw a bush burning with fire or with light. And he got close to it, and it was the, the fire was the presence of God himself. And as soon as he got close to the presence of God, he heard the voice of God coming out of the presence. And the voice said, take off your shoes, this is holy ground. Whenever you're in the presence of God, it's a holy thing. God's presence brings holiness. And so he was in the presence and he heard the voice of God. And God said, listen, go get my people and bring them back to this mountain to worship me. Fast forward a year later, he did it. Now he's got nearly a million people with him. And here they finally come to the place where it all began. Moses went to the place where he knew he heard God the first time. And sometimes we hear the Lord in our lives. He speaks to us or we experience his presence. And then we go through a variety of circumstances. Life happens. But you know, we always have to go back to the place where we last heard God speak and make sure we're following what God told us to do. And so Moses brings them. He said, I got them. Here they are. It's your nation. Here, here they are. And, of course, there was some interesting drama and trauma. Listen to last week's message about how they had to learn a few things along the way. And so they arrived now in Exodus chapter 19 at the base of this mountain. Now, before we look at this, I just want to say something. The presence of God is so important for us to understand. God has always longed to be present with his people. We know in the beginning, the Bible tells us that Adam walked with God's presence now, the Hebrew word for presence is the word panim, P-A-N-I-Y-M is how you'd probably spell it in English, panim, and it means literally the face of someone or face to face. What it means is when a person's countenance or their face is looking at you and they're aware of you and you're aware of them looking at you, that's the Hebrew idea of presence. Have you ever been somewhere and you thought you were alone and you felt like there were eyes on you? Somebody was staring and you just were aware of someone else's presence, right? Maybe look around and see there's somebody looking at you from over here, right? Or somebody you didn't know, hadn't seen in a long time, maybe they were seeing you. You can sometimes feel the presence or the face of someone aware of you even when you don't observe it. And that's really what this Hebrew idea is. It's not just God being in a place. It's God's face paying attention in a way that you perceive it. 
So the presence of God is when you are in the face of God. It's, it's a manifestation of God looking at you knowingly and being aware of you. And so often we live our lives, and the Bible tells us God is everywhere. He's all over the place, but we don't always feel or are aware of his presence. But there are times when suddenly we feel, really, what we're feeling is the face of God. I've had countless people tell me that they've, when they visited our church or when they visit from time to time, they've come onto the grounds and they suddenly felt different. They felt like they were, uh, they didn't know how to describe it. One guy said, I got all, I got these butterflies in my stomach. Somebody else said, you know, I got pears on the back of my head stood up. And someone else, you know, they just said, I just felt warm and peaceful inside. But they were aware, what they were aware is God was observing them and he was allowing them to know it. That's the presence of God when you know that God and his love and mercy is looking at you. Oh, it's a good thing. Phew. A woman came up after the first service and she said, Pastor John, great, great woman, loves the Lord, been come to know Jesus here and God has done so much. She said, I, I don't know, I, I want to feel that presence. I don't know if I've ever felt his presence. I said, okay, let me ask you a question. Have you ever come to church and, and felt suddenly like, like the peace or the love of God? She said, oh yeah, every time I come into this auditorium, it's like everything I'm worried about disappears and I just feel this peace. And so I began to ask her questions. And I said, that's the presence of God. That's his, him manifesting his awareness of you, his love, his mercy. He's looking at you. Turn to somebody and say, I want to live in the face of God. But here's the thing. Sin causes us to be afraid of the face of God, which is why when Adam sinned in the book of Genesis, he and Eve ran and hid from the panim of God. They didn't want him to see them. We sometimes are running from God because we don't want God to see us. But here's the thing about God. He's so merciful because of what Jesus has done that when we fall, we're not to run away from God. We're to run to God because he's not, there to, he's not just there to judge us. He's there to take what's wrong, the sin, and remove it from us. Praise the Lord. See, we can only be restored in the presence of God. We can only be forgiven in the presence of God. He's the only one that can remove our sin and can help us to be restored and have joy again. So the presence of God was awesome. And the presence of God's favor and love was separated from the human experience for centuries. But God's plan was always to be present on earth with his people. And so now Moses is going to introduce the people to the presence of God. And this is clear in Psalm 68 in verse 7, if I can just read it. Psalm 68 in verse 7. It said, Oh God, when you went out before your people, there's that word before, panim, in the face of your people, when you marched through the wilderness, the earth shook, the heavens dropped rain at the presence of the panim, the face of God. Sinai itself, that's the mountain, was moved at the presence of God, the God of Israel. So they were going to meet and to experience the presence of God. So in chapter 19 in verse 1 of Exodus, we have the story. In the third month after the children of Israel had gone out from the land of Egypt, on the same day they came to the wilderness of Sinai, for they had departed from Rephidim and had come to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness. Even so, Israel camped there before the mountain. This was the mountain that Moses had first experienced God's voice and presence. Now, verse 3 tells us that Moses begins this journey of introduction by going back up the mountain. And if you read the next five or six chapters, you're going to see that Moses goes up and down a lot. There's about eight trips up and down the mountain recorded in this passage of Scripture. But we're just going to look at a few of them. So this is his first journey up the mountain. He's leaving the people behind. And it says in verse 3, Moses went up to God, and the Lord called to him from the mountain and said, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and the children of Israel, quote, this is God speaking, you've seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on angels' wings and brought you to myself. In other words, you saw that with your enemies, I judged them, but you, I took care of you. I brought you on eagles' wings. I've been gentle and gracious and preserving and healing and delivering and careful to love you. There's a difference. You have to know this about me. There's a difference between when I'm dealing with my enemies and when I'm dealing with my people. 
I just love that God's helping them to understand the distinction. And I brought you to myself, meaning I brought you here to this mountain. Now, therefore, if you'll indeed obey my voice and keep my covenant, then you shall be a special treasure to me above all people, for all the earth is mine. And that means everyone belongs to me, but you're going to have a very special place in my purpose. Verse 6, and you shall be to me, notice, a kingdom of priests, a kingdom, that's a nation, of priests and a holy nation. This means you're going to be not only a, a, a nationality, a country, but you're also going to be a, a people, an ethnicity that are going to bear a relationship with me. I'm raising you up to hold this relationship with me. And he said, you're going to be a kingdom, that's a country or a nation, of priests. Everybody say priests. Now, priests are those who go directly into the presence of God for someone else. A priest is a go-between, between a worshiper and the deity. And God says, I'm going to make all of Israel priests. Now, I want you to understand this. God's plan for the Jewish people, for Israel, was not that they would be chosen to minister to each other, but that they would become priests for the Gentiles that they were to be the people that were going to introduce God to the rest of the world. Remember, God said to Abraham, I will bless you and your children, the, the Jewish people, I will bless you, and through you, the Israelites, all the families of the earth will be blessed. I'm going to use you to bless everyone. God's end game was always to bless the whole world, not just the Jewish people, but they would have a special role in introducing the world to this wonderful God. Unfortunately, they didn't do that by their own admission very well. They mostly tried to, tried to capitalize and make it about themselves. You know, any church, I'm going to tell you something, any church can be great, have lots of people, be very connected, they can be loving, they can be loving each other. But if a church stops reaching people, if a church stops being aware that, that, uh, that there's empty seats and those seats need to be filled with people that don't know Jesus, if a church stops being aware that it's not just about me getting my blessing, my healing, my prosperity, my family fixed, my, 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 but we also exist not just to receive the blessing, but to go and to preach the blessing and to reconcile others to God, that church is going to become ingrown. It's going to become incestuous. It's going to lose the special touch of God. And that's why Abundant Life, we have net, we all, how big is too big? It's not about bigness. It's about growth. We should always realize that God has blessed us so that we can be a blessing to others. Amen. It's a special burden to know that you're called not just to be with God, but to also represent God to the world. And the church is called a holy nation. The Bible says in 1 Peter 2, 9, concerning Christians, the church, but you are a chosen generation, a holy priesthood, a royal nation. That means you are a kingdom of priests and you are a kingdom of intercessors, and you, the church, are a holy nation. And it said, sent to show forth the praises of him who called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light. So we find that the church has the same mission that Israel was given right here on Mount Sinai. We are called kings and priests unto God. We have a job to bring reconciliation to the world. We have a job to demonstrate the worship and the praise of the true and living God. Christians ought not to be ashamed to be a Christian. You ought not to be embarrassed to say, I go to that church where we worship and we praise and we shout and we serve the poor and we care about people. And, and you ought not to be ashamed. It's the greatest thing. Jesus made you different. I love in, in, in 1 Peter 2.9, it says, you are a chosen generation. He calls you a peculiar people. Just go ahead and say, all right, I admit it, I'm peculiar. All right, we, he, we're, we're different. We're peculiar. Those Jewish folks, they were peculiar. But God said, I'm going to use you weirdos. I got a plan for you. Just embrace it. Embrace your own weirdness and thank God for it. <laughs> Hallelujah. He said, I'm going to make you a kingdom of priests. And he, he said, uh, 
And he said, now go and tell these words of the children of Israel. So Moses goes down the mountain. Verse 7, and he came to call for the elders of the children and laid all these words which the Lord had commanded him. And all the people together said, all the Lord has said we will do. So we accept this responsibility. Then God tells Moses to get the people ready for his presence. So Moses goes back up the mountain. It says in the end of verse 8, so Moses brought back the words of the people to the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, behold, I come to you in a thick cloud, and the people may hear when I speak to you. I'm going to speak and they're going to hear it and believe forever, believe you forever. So Moses told these words to the people of the Lord. And the Lord said to Moses, go to the people and consecrate them today and tomorrow and let them wash their clothes and let them be ready for the third day. For on the third day, the Lord will come down upon Mount Sinai in the sight of the people. And you'll set bounds for the people all around saying, take heed to yourselves that you do not go up to the mountain to touch its base. Whoever touches the mountain shall surely die. So it says in verse 14, Moses went down from the mountain to the people and sanctified the people and they washed their clothes. So God basically says, okay, Moses, the first conversation, I want to make you a king, a nation of priests, and I want to use you as priests unto me. Go tell them. So Moses says, this is what God's plan is for us. They said, let's do it. Moses goes up and says, God, they're all in. God said, okay, now I'm going to, now we've made introductions. Now I'm going to personally talk to them. I want them to experience my presence and hear my voice. But we're going to get three days to get ready. They're going to ritually, ceremonially, they're going to get clean. They're going to get in their very best. They're going to spend the next few days fasting and preparing. And then on the third day, I'm going to come in my visible manifested glory on this mountain, and they will see my presence on the mountain. And when they do, I'm going to talk to you, and they're going to hear it so they can hear my voice and feel my presence. So the Bible tells us that's what happened in verse 16. It came to pass on the third day in the morning that there were thunderings and lightnings and a thick cloud on the mountain. And the sound of the trumpet was very loud, so that all the people who were in the camp trembled. You've got to picture this. Uh, sometimes we've seen these videos of volcanoes, and they say when you're in, even within 30 miles of some of these things, it's frightening. But some of these volcanoes, they, they have this, like this thick, thick cloud of ash that goes way up into the atmosphere. And then sometimes you'll see light in the middle as fire is coming up out of the inside of the cloud, and there'll be lightning flashing in that cloud. That's sort of the geological phenomenon that happened on Mount Sinai. This thick cloud with lightning flashing in it and fire in the middle of it, or light in the middle of it. And the earth is shaking, and They hear trumpets. Now, these weren't trumpets they were blowing. These were trumpets that the angels were blowing. The voice of angels. And it was this loud trumpet sound. And it kept getting louder and louder and louder. Uh, This is your day to meet God. Now, notice it says this. And Moses brought the people out of the camp to meet God with God. And they stood at the foot of the mountain. Remember God said, don't bring them up on the mountain. Not yet. Let them just stand in the presence. Now Mount Sinai was completely in smoke because the Lord descended upon it with fire. It, its smoke ascended like the smoke of a furnace and the whole mountain quaked greatly. And when the blast of the trumpet sounded long and became louder and louder and louder, there came this moment. You picture everybody's there. They're trembling. You know, they're standing there. This thing is getting louder and louder. These trumpets are coming out of the cloud, blowing this. All of a sudden, at the apex of that moment, Moses spoke. Elohim, Jehovah, I am here. We are here. Whatever he said. And look at the last part of that verse. And God answered him by voice. God spoke back and they heard it. They heard the voice of God. One place it said it's like the voice of uh, many waters. Uh, someone said it's like the voice of thunder. 
Uh, we don't know exactly how it sounded, but it was a massive voice, and it was extremely frightening. Now, notice, after Moses and God had this first conversation, God says now to Moses, now you alone, you come up a little higher on the mountain. Verse 20, then the Lord came down on Mount, Tom, on Mount Sinai, on the top of the mountain, and the Lord called to Moses to the top, and Moses went up. So Moses went up this mountain, and then Moses heard in the presence of God, God give him the Ten Commandments. Now, there's different views on this. Some people believe that Moses alone heard the Ten Commandments and the initial law given, and then he came and told the people. But really, the textual evidence, which sometimes a little bit because it goes back and forth, the textual evidence is that the people were at the foot of Mount Sinai after God responded to Moses. God said, come up here. Moses came up into the cloud, and God gave Moses the Ten Commandments, but the people heard it. They heard the Ten Commandments themselves, spoken by God himself. And I love it in chapter 20. It begins this section where God is speaking. The people are standing there. It says, and God spoke all these words, saying, I am Jehovah, your Elohim, who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage, and you shall have no other gods before me. I guess I, that, that, that's okay. <laughs> I mean, you're standing before this burning mountain with lightning, this voice, these trumpets, and this voice says, "You, I'm the God that brought you out of Egypt, and you're not going to have any other gods before me. And then he gives them the Ten Commandments, and they hear him. Now, in verse 18, it says this. After the Ten Commandments are given, the 17, verse 17 ends those commandments. It says, now all the people witnessed the thunderings, the lightning flashes, the sound of the trumpet, and the mountain smoking. And when the people saw it, they trembled and stood far off. They backed off. Then they said to Moses, listen, from now on, Moses comes back down, you know. They said, from now on, you speak with us and we'll listen. But don't let God speak with us lest we die. And Moses said to the people, don't fear, for God has come to test you, and that his fear may be upon you, so that you may not sin, that you might know to respect and honor his greatness. So the people stood far off, but Moses drew near the thick darkness where God was. Now, in the next few chapters, chapter 21 through 24, we see Moses goes back up the mountain again, just a little bit, and God gives him the civil law, the basic civil law. Uh, the basis of the Jewish national law, ceremonial law. And it's from chapter 21 through chapter 24. And then God, when he finishes, tells Moses, now go back down the mountain and tell what I just told you to the people and write it down. And once you've written it down, you can come up higher. You can come back. You know, sometimes we want to go higher with God, but God says, listen, I want you to take everything I just said, I want you to digest it, I want you to write it down, and I want you to get that done, and once that's done, then you can come deeper. And very often in the presence of God, we experience and have an experience with God. God gives us a direction because the presence of God always brings direction from God. There'll be a voice or some kind of direction that comes from the presence, and we have to do what he said. I've met many people that say, you know, Pastor, I haven't experienced the presence of God or haven't heard the voice of God in a year or two years or whatever. Listen, just because you haven't had a special fresh experience with the voice of God, hearing his voice or sensing his spirit, doesn't mean he's left you and doesn't mean he hasn't, he's not very engaged. Sometimes we didn't fully do what he last told us to do. And if you want to go deeper into the presence of God, you've got to finish what he told you last time. Amen. You can't have half-finished projects. Sometimes we start obeying God and then we quit. And uh, God wants us to be fully obedient. So Moses had to go, and he had to finish what God told him to do. Then he could go back up the mountain. Turn to somebody and say, you got to finish first things first. And so Moses goes back up higher, and he has uh, an even greater experience. And this time the Lord says, I want you to bring leaders with you. So God invites Aaron and Nadab and Abihu, which are Aaron's sons, Moses' nephews, and 70 of the elders of Israel. Look in verse 9. It says, Then Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they, and I love this, they, not just Moses, they saw the God of Israel. 
And there was under his feet, as it were, a paved work of sapphire stone. And it was like the very heavens in its clarity. We, and most scholars agree, and, and Jewish scholars would say, that they didn't see the face of God because no one can see his face directly and live. But they saw God kind of lifted up the cloud and allowed them to see his feet. Isn't that awesome? But they're right there in the presence, the face of God. Whether they saw them, they, they, they didn't need to see the outline of the face of God. They were in the face of God. They were in the presence of God. And I love these next words because it's so awesome. Here they are. And it says in verse 11, but on the nobles of the children of Israel, he didn't lay his hand. So they saw God and they ate and they drank. They had lunch. Right there at, at God's feet. They're seeing the feet of God and they just sit down and eat. And what I love about this is God has always wanted to bring us so close to him that we can enjoy. Uh, eating is like fellowship. It's celebration. It's, it's relaxing. When you eat with somebody, you're in, you're in covenant with them. And of the Jewish mind, to eat in the presence of someone was really a great sign of relationship and intimacy. And so here God is letting them eat in his presence. They're relaxed in the presence of God. Now the rest of the children of Israel, they're too scared to come up that high. But at least these leaders went up a little bit and got to experience the face of the Lord. And it says uh, in verse 12, Then the Lord said to Moses, Come up to me on the mountain up here, and I will give you tablets of stone and the law and the commandments which I have written that you may teach them. So Moses took his assistant Joshua, and he went up to the mountain of God. So they're, they're going up higher and higher. There's levels as they go up. In verse 15, it says, Then Moses went up into the mountain, and a cloud covered the mountain. And the glory of the Lord rested on Mount Sinai. And the cloud covered for six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. And the sight of the glory of the Lord was like a consuming fire on the top of the mountain in the eyes of the children of Israel. They're still watching this. And so Moses went into the midst of the cloud and went up into the mountain. And Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. I mean, he is literally in the closest proximity to the face of God, to the presence of God anyone could be. And it was there that God gave him instructions. Now, we're going to pick up with what he did after this. But I want you to see that first they had to agree to be his people, to be his priests, to be his kingdom of priests. Then he wanted them to meet them so they come and they get to be in the presence of God and hear the voice of God. Then the leaders come up a little closer and get to experience the presence of God a little more. Now, now God is taking Moses up into the closest you could be, right into the very holy place where God's presence is. And now God is going to talk with Moses for 40 days. Not only does God talk with Moses, but God gives Moses a series of visions. He is caught up to heaven, and he's allowed to see a room in heaven where God dwells and the furniture that's in that room. And after being in the presence of God, he comes down the mountain 40 days later, and he has directions on how to set up a physical place so that the presence of God could go with them wherever they went. And a priesthood that would serve to worship God day and night. Now, I want you to look at one passage as we come to an end. And that's in the book of Hebrews chapter 12. In the book of Hebrews, we have these early Christians. And these Christians in Hebrews were all Jewish people who had come to receive Jesus as Messiah. So they were uh, Jewish people who had been completed in their faith in Christ. And they were going through persecution because many of their family members who didn't accept Jesus were persecuting them. And so the apostle, and I, I believe it's Paul, and a lot of people would argue with that, so it doesn't matter. The writer of the Hebrews, the apostle who's writing it, uh, gives these Christians, these Jewish believers in Jesus, 
some information about how much greater Christ is than the Old Testament relationship they once had. That the Old Testament relationship with Israel was good, but it was the foundation for this which is better. All of that happened to set the groundwork for Jesus to come and make a new thing possible. And so as the writer of the Hebrews is talking about this, he goes back to this moment we just studied on Mount Sinai where God introduces himself to his people and they feel his presence and they hear his voice. And in this case, they quit. But, Paul, but, but here the writer of Hebrews is saying that we're in something far better. Now listen to what he says. I'm going to read this in the modern English version. I like this translation. Verse 18 says, You have not come to a mountain that cannot be touched and that burns with fire, and to blackness and darkness and tempest or storm, and to the sound of a trumpet, and to a voice speaking words such as those who heard them and begged that the word would not be spoken to them anymore. That's what we just read about. For they, Israel, could not endure that which was commanded. If so much as an animal touches the mountain, it shall be stoned or thrust through with a spear. So terrible was the sight that Moses said, I am terrified and trembling. This was frightening. He says, but listen, you haven't come to that mountain. You in the New Testament church, that's the Old Testament, the New Testament church, you've come to a new mountain. Verse 22, but you have come to Mount Zion. And to the city of the living God, and to the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels. Let's stop right there. He said, you've come to a new kind of mountain. This isn't the mountain of the law where anyone who makes a mistake or touches that presence would be killed. You've come to the Mount of Zion, the Mount of Mercy, the Mount where God's presence lives, where David set up a tabernacle and people could openly worship God, a place where all nations can come and worship. You've come to a new mountain. Hallelujah. It's not a mountain where you have to be afraid of the presence of God. It's a mountain where you are in the presence of God. It's, he calls it the city of the living God. That's the believers, we're, we're, we make up a city of the living God. And he said the heavenly Jerusalem. He's not saying that, uh, that, you know, he's not talking about some future Jerusalem. He's saying there is a heavenly, a spiritual Jerusalem that we have come to right now, and that is this city, this community of people who know Jesus. And to an innumerable company of angels, they had some angels, we've got far more. Everybody say, far more angels. In verse 23, he makes it clear, you have come to the general assembly and the church of the firstborn. Not going to come, you're there. He calls this new place the assembly of the firstborn. Jesus was the firstborn from the dead, and everyone who accepts Christ, we are also born again from the dead. Praise the Lord. He calls it the church, the assembly of the firstborn, who are enrolled in heaven. And we've come to God. Everybody say, come to God. The judge of all and to the spirits of righteous ones made perfect. What's he talking about? Well, when a person comes to Christ, the Bible says that their sins are forgiven. That Christ stepped on, and when he stepped on that cross, he took our sins and bore our infirmities. And that when he shed his blood, it paid the price for the wrath of God to pass over me. Christ took God's wrath so that we don't have to. Our sins were laid on Jesus. He was righteous and didn't deserve to die, but he died for us taking our sins so that when we trust in him, we could get what we don't deserve. His righteousness is given to us. Our brokenness given to him, his righteousness is given to us. That's why the Bible says that if any man be in Christ, he's a new creation. Old things passed away, all things become new. In 2 Corinthians 5.21, it says that God made Jesus, who knew no sin, to become sin for us so that we might become the righteousness of God in him. So if you're a Christian today, if you put your faith in Jesus, you are 
righteous in the sight of God. That doesn't mean everything in your flesh is right yet. It doesn't mean we got everything figured out. But in your spirit, you've been given the gift of God's righteousness. You are standing right before the Lord. Hallelujah. And in your spirit, you are a righteous person made perfect. God does that the moment you trust in Christ. He didn't even say you're going to get there. He said you have already come to the spirits of righteous people made perfect. Thank God. Turn to somebody and say, if you know Jesus, if you love Jesus, if you've received Jesus, your spirit is righteous in his sight. Let's give the Lord praise. And finally, he says, and you have come to Jesus, the mediator of a new covenant. Praise the Lord. We have something new, and it's built on the old. It comes from the old. That story, we need to know what happened to Israel. They want, they, but see, they, because they were still in their sin, couldn't get any closer than the foot of the mountain. But now, Jesus, he's the one that went from the presence of God and became a human like us. And then he went right back into the presence of God and opened a way so that now when you accept Christ, Christ comes to live in you and with you. You are in the presence of God. And you can hear the voice of God. You don't have to see a, uh, you don't have to see a smoking mountain and hear a thundering voice because now God lives in us. 1 John 4.4 4 says, Greater is he that is in us than he that is in the world. Jesus said, My presence, my spirit, he is with you, but there's coming a time where he will dwell in you. We're living in those days where we are in the presence of God and we hear the voice of God. Hallelujah. Aren't you glad? Yeah. Folks, if you believe, say, well, how come I still mess up? It's because we don't think according to what the Bible says. We act like he's still far away. We still believe that somehow he's on a smoking, scary mountain and we aren't worthy to approach him. But when you know Jesus and you know what he did for you, you can come right up to the presence of God in the face of God, with the blood of Jesus. And you can accept your forgiveness and mercy because his blood covers you. Yes. Hallelujah. Yes. You don't have to hide from the presence of God like Adam did. You can run to the presence of God because Jesus will cover you and forgive you and cleanse you. Isn't that good news? Yes. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I want you to bow your heads right now all over this place. I want to say a prayer for you. There may be some people here today, and you'd say, Pastor John, um, I, I want to know the presence of God. I want to experience that presence. I want to hear him speak in my heart. I want to hear his voice. And, and, and I would say to you today, God so longs for you to come to him and to pray that prayer to receive him. Now, here's the deal. The Bible says, real simple, to whoever receives Jesus, to them... God gives the power to be the children of God. The way that you enter into the presence of God and receive it in your heart is by receiving Jesus. So I'm going to say a simple prayer right now, and I'm going to ask all in this congregation who are willing, who would like this prayer, who need this prayer, or just want to affirm this prayer, to say this prayer out loud after me. It's a prayer of accepting Jesus and receiving him, and it will bring you peace. Just say, Dear Father in heaven, I come to you right now. In the name of Jesus, Father, forgive me for all of my sins. I believe Jesus took my sins when he died on the cross. And his blood was shed so I could be forgiven. I accept my forgiveness. And I receive the power of his blood to cleanse me now. I also receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, the presence of God in my heart. I boldly confess, Jesus is Lord. And I will serve you, Father. I will follow you. Now let's give him praise and thanks for that right now. Praise God. 
Folks, if you prayed that prayer with me right now, and if you didn't know before, you can know today. If you prayed that from your heart, God heard it. Your sins are forgiven. You might even feel like a, like a sense of just peace, like something has just been lifted. Uh, you might sense this, this uh, it, sometimes it's just a feeling of warmth that comes over you. That is the presence of God's peace filling your heart and life. And you can know today, if you prayed that prayer, on April 30th, 2017, at Abundant Life Christian Center in the second service, I prayed and accepted Jesus Christ as my Savior. My sins are forgiven, and, the, and I am God's child. Amen. Let's give God thanks for that right now and give Him praise. Now listen, if you prayed that prayer, that means you've made a decision to live for Jesus, to follow him. And it's important to follow Jesus and to enjoy his presence every day that we grow closer to him. We do that in a few ways. One important way is that we get in a good church that teaches the Bible and we go every week to hear his word. It won't make you any more of a Christian, but it will help you to grow as a Christian. So find a good church. This is a good church. If you don't have one, come and learn about the Bible here and grow in the things of God. If you have a good church, get in church and learn the word of God. Second of all, tell somebody that you accepted or received Jesus as your Savior. Let somebody know what God's doing in your life. Uh, people need to hear the testimony of what God's done. And then also, talk to God every day because he's there, he's with you. That's what prayer is. It's just telling God what you're thinking, what you're feeling. And then let God talk to you. And the number one way he talks to us is through the Bible. Get a good Bible and read it. Now, after the service this morning, we have a prayer team that's going to be here at the altar and right here at the front of the church. And if you prayed today to give your life to Jesus and you'd like to know more about what that means, maybe you don't even know for sure where you are in your spiritual journey and you'd like some help, come on forward. We'll talk to you. If you need a Bible, we'll get you a Bible. And we want to help you on your journey of discovery in the presence of God. He loves you. He's with you. And he has things to say to you. He wants you to hear his voice. Praise the Lord. One more time, let's thank God for what he's done in our hearts. Praise the Lord.